Ladies and gentlemen, Karen and Rick. Famous, famous people. <laughs> yeah, right. Infamous. In <laughs> infamous. This is the very first time I have ever set my feet in West Virginia. There's his feet. I there. miss it. <laughs> and we are in Harper's Ferry, 285 people on this really cool kind of slaty rock outcropping. We have the Shenandoah River coming down the side and the Potomac here. So very last That's minute, just great. so it's up there, we are literally going to walk from West Virginia to Maryland. So that is the whole plan. <laughs> we are in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. Now I'm gonna turn the screen around because it's super pretty, but the light is waning because we are in December. Um, so Karen and Rick came and picked me up in Washington, DC. Doesn't it look gorgeous to oh, here? So they picked me up in Washington, DC, finished my conference day, which is super fun. I almost stayed up till midnight last night, which is very late for me, but I danced. Would you dance? I danced. I had so much fun. Check this out, everyone. So there is the Potomac River, or you're saying the indigenous people pronounce it more as... Potomac. Potomac, um, which is either River of Swans or River of Trade, based on my uh, um, Googling today. So you're looking down. So on the left is Maryland. On the right is well, Virginia more or less, and I am standing in West Virginia, and we were just reading all about John Brown, who prior to the American Civil War, really tried to take over an armory to end enslavement. I've done a lot of history of enslavement the last couple of days in Washington, D.C. Powerful, powerful bit of history. So here we are. So why don't we walk over? Should we do it? Mm -hmm. We are going to walk, ladies and gentlemen. There we go. So... There you go. Maine is 1,160 miles. It's still a long way. Mm -hmm. And Georgia, 1,000 miles. So, so it's 2,200, 2,300 miles altogether on the Appalachian Trail, which is almost exactly 3,000 kilometers. Oh, well, I'm at three states. It could well be service providers or something. So, but we are going to walk over a bridge and walk to Maryland. How's that for a plan? So West Virginia separates from Virginia, of course, on the back of the Civil War and the abolition movement, which is incredibly important. It's cool, too. Uh, it's probably getting down to a somewhere around freezing, I would think. Um, 40s, yeah. Yeah, well, of course, they feel the humidity. Now, I wish Finn were here, but of course, he's doing... Oh, I wish Finn were here, yeah, yes. But he's doing his exams. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then Friday, I will get home. Um, and then believe it or not, I'm actually going away the very next day oh, or just one night, but oh, with, with the kid. Oh, uh, yeah, we're going for a birthday celebration down in Fairmont Hot Springs right. in BC. Um, but you can see the old bridge systems all through here. So Harper was literally a fellow who got a permit from the colonial government in Virginia to have ferries going across here. So hence Harper's Ferry. So that's significant, but then they had this huge armory here. And remember, and you'll remember this from all my tours over the years, if we talk about the history of Turtle Island of this continent, travel was first by water, then by train, and this train bridge, then by car, and then by plane. So this is, and these guys are telling me that this is the commuter train that goes into Washington, D.C. So we obviously did some sightseeing on our way out here, but if we'd driven from D.C. direct, it would have been about an hour and a half. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. But train probably faster. And faster, I've sure, done sure. It, done yeah. It years ago, reverse. Um, but I, I don't. Re I mean, it was forty years ago. Forty years ago. Well, yeah, oh yeah. Oh, that padlock's know. become such a tradition around the world. Yeah, there, yeah. Yeah. All around the world. yeah. Now, that started different. in Paris, but yeah, these padlocks here. Yeah. But we are walking. So I wonder at what point are we in Maryland once we get to the other side of the river, or is it halfway across? Oh, you know, um, it is and, interesting. You literally have to look on a map. Because some places, the boundary line could have been right over there. Oh, okay. And like Maryland would own all this sand and mud. <laughs> well, we came up around through that valley there, and we saw the sign that said, Welcome to West Virginia. So now that I've spent time in West Virginia, I might as well walk over to that. Yes. <laughs> but, Typically, Maryland owns to the, either the high water line or the low water line, uh, on the Virginia side. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they own that, right. They and that's true. DC owns the whole river. I was looking at the map. Okay. Yeah, the District okay. of Columbia. But I learned that they used to have part of Virginia, but they ceded it back because of, of course, slavery once again. So, you know, as what was called the peculiar institution is so deeply part of this country. I did the other day, Sunday, I went to the new African American Museum. Oh, there's a lot of coins there, which one would 
expect to see. Yep, I'm always careful. Um, such a, well, I'm always careful with my phone that it doesn't actually fall out of the gimbal. <laughs> yeah. That's why I put mine on my person's That's right. I wouldn't want yeah. to put those locks out there. Yeah, I mean, they're lazy. Oh, I would, I, would, I would go plunging in there. <laughs> it's just not cold enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how neat is this? So, yeah, we're obviously well into December now. We're a few days away from the shortest day of the year. But we had spectacular light. So I obviously had to reset this little tour because the, the sound cut out. But if you see the light at the very beginning, it was just up on the top. Now I would call these Laurentian forests, but they're Appalachian forests, I guess, because we're in Appalachia. Um, and all deciduous forests, so it must be spectacular in early oh, October. Oh, yeah. Really yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I could totally see coming back for that. I mean, the, yeah, a lot of these photos you see kind of. Now look at the old house on the far yeah. side some sort of a control thing. So this city was burnt during the Civil War. So there's Harpers Ferry, 1931 for that tunnel up over there. Yeah, so we are now, I guess, we're officially in Maryland now. <laughs> yes, we might as well walk down. Yeah, we might as well walk down and then we'll yeah. be in Maryland and then we can go back over to Harpers Ferry. Well, we saw a canal on the other side, which would be a classic mill. I thought there was something yeah. I came out here so, with a friend, you should show yeah. the stairs. <laughs> Uh, you want to see the stairs down here? This is where we're walking. These are the kind of stairs that we have uh, all our ski hills, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, because then your boots don't slip as you walk up and down. Right, right. But the fact that they're see through, yeah. Oh, so that really does scare some people, doesn't it? I'm amazing. Yeah. Oh, you, you're doing great. Well, I can do it. But we're actually going to swim back over the river. <laughs> Rick, Rick's going to do that. So, yes, everyone. So I'm going to have. Two days, well, two nights, but this is the Potomac River right here. The same one, of course, that goes right past famous Washington, D.C. Here we are over at the Maryland Heights Trail, and there is the Appalachian Trail North, the Maryland Heights Trail. I'd have to read about all these things. I've been, as these two have been giving me a wonderful tour through their beautiful state, I've been Googling everything and getting all my, my numbers and statistics, and apparently we can go rock climbing up over there. So Rick, Rick's going to lead me up. He's going to set the rope and I'll follow him up there. But welcome to Maryland, ladies and gentlemen. So I'll just go over to this one little sign here. So, oh yeah, you can see this is where the canal was, absolutely. So this was another canal system. 1733, this was all settled. Now, obviously, this has been indigenous land for, well, thousands of years. And there we are, Harper's Ferry, Mile 60. Yeah, this is the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. So this of course, is American Industrial Revolution. Ah, saying slow connection. Mm. So it is saying slow connection. It's probably just, I mean, it's rural enough. Yeah. These are all the different games you do, these live virtual oh, trips. Sure. But, uh, well, with this yeah. yeah, oh, yes, probably exactly what it is. The, yeah, but there is Little Harper's Ferry, 285 people over there. But there's actually a more modern community called Bolivar, which I think is so cool. Um, Simon Bolivar. So there's Harper's Ferry. It's exactly how I imagine the images of, of uh, West Virginia. You know, these, these yeah. rolling rocky outcrops. Be interesting to go and tour it a little bit more. So there's their 13 year old puppy. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll come back up and we'll go back to West Virginia. You good there, Karen? I would just imagine, yes, when all these trees are out a different time of year. Tons of interesting birds. We've seen hawks and turkey vultures, which we get on the West Coast as well. There we are. <laughs> there we are. So we, we have just been in Maryland and we are gonna walk back over to West Virginia. Now, how far are we from your place? An hour. An hour? Yeah. So there's the Shenandoah, which well, we played music on the way up here, but um, and that West Virginia song, you know, it's such a famous river. And this is where it meets up with the Potomac. And then they go out and it's tidal right past DC because we saw tidal floods today, didn't we? Um, and then I guess it empties out to Chesapeake Bay. Is that yeah. correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, yeah. So this is one of the great river systems of the United States. Natural, natural border between the two states, obviously. You know, Maryland to the north and then West Virginia, of course. West Virginia is under 2 million people, 1.8 million. And Virginia itself is 8.6 million. But that greater D.C. area, they're saying is about 3 million. Oh. And the District of Columbia itself is, is about 750,000. But it felt big. Everyone goes on about the traffic, but I just, I must have been lucky the last couple of days. <laughs> I just didn't seem 
seem too bad whatsoever. So let's go back across to Harper's Ferry, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> welcome here. Oh, we've got our friends all down here. Give us a wave there, Karen. <laughs> I didn't know you thought <laughs> We are in Virginia, and uh, I'm not going to talk very much today because this is all news to me, but we are with a local historian, well, more than local, a national historian and archaeologist. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. That's, that sounds good to me. But we have literally, in less than an hour, we've uh, done Civil War, Emancipation, wheat being exported to the Caribbean, fox hunting, uh, segregation, desegregation, resegregation, and beautiful architecture. So I'd like to first of all introduce you to Travis. Your surname is? Shaw. Shaw. Travis Shaw. Oh, great. That is very English. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Travis Shaw, who is, well, you're a historian. Please, mm -hmm. do you mind telling us? Sure. Stuff? Yeah. So I'm the director of education for the Virginia Piedmont Heritage Area. We're a nonprofit organization that works in five counties in Northern Virginia to promote, um, historic preservation we advocate for historic preservation and we also educate we go into schools we do adult education programs just trying to teach people to appreciate this beautiful historic landscape all the historic and natural resources that we enjoy out here and so at Middlesburg is Karen can you even tell us this one it's the middle of between, it's the middle coach stop between the port of Alexandria on the Potomac River and the frontier Winchester and the frontier Winchester, so that was established. But most of this population, post-Indigenous, mm -hmm. is coming in in the late 1600s and then into the... Yes, yeah, so, this uh, European settlement in the Middleburg area really takes off in the 1740s, 50s, and 60s. Um, you're going to see a large number of English planters coming up from the Tidewater of Virginia, um, bringing plantation agriculture with them, bringing enslaved labor with them. And they're going to kind of coalesce, as, as she said, along this road from the big port city of Alexandria and the frontier uh, settlement of Winchester. So this becomes a major transportation hub for this part of Virginia throughout the 18th century, 19th century. Um, you're going to see, as you said, um, international commerce, you know, locally grown wheat, flour being sent all over the world. You're going to see settlers. Um, heading to the western frontier along this road. You're going to see armies traveling on this road during the Revolutionary War, during the Civil War. Um, Middleburg, although it's a very small town, has a very outsized influence on American history. And when we say outsized, uh, the, the Kennedys were here, mm -hmm. and it also became one of the first places to, I guess, reintegrate, you were saying. Yeah. Um, it, Fascinating history, as I said, um, during the 18th century, 19th century, you're going to see a large enslaved population around here. And after the Civil War, we're going to have the development of a number of villages, um, predominantly African-American villages, St. Louis, Willisville, Howardsville, Maxville, all of these settlements. Um, but by the turn of the 20th century, you know, Jim Crow is the law of the land here in Virginia, so Middleburg will be segregated legally. And that's not really going to change until the Kennedy administration. 1961, John F. Kennedy and his family come out to Middleburg. Um, Mrs. Kennedy was a very avid equestrian, so it's kind of a natural fit for her to come out here. Mm. And the attention that that brings to this town is going to lead um, the local NAACP to work with business owners, work with um, local Catholic priests to start desegregating this town um, years before many of the other nearby towns because that international attention is all of a sudden on this tiny little town. And actually, speak of the Kennedys, this yep. is a really cool sight in the Kennedy story. I do want to point out, and I very genuinely did not know that fox hunting was still a big thing in the United States. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Middleburg is kind of the epicenter of American hunt country, um, and it has been since the 19th century. The oldest established fox hunt mm -hmm. in America, the Piedmont Foxhounds, is established in 1840 right here. And then 13 years later, the oldest continuous horse show, the middle uh, Upperville Colton Horse Show, uh, which is just west of town a few miles. So long history of equestrian sports, horsemanship, um, just across the street there is the National Sporting Library and Museum, which focuses on all things related to equestrian sports. Uh, but and yeah. that's national, national? Like national, United national. All oh, right. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, you've got a ton of stuff here in it's a small a really community. It's a really neat little town. It uh, is a fascinating place, yeah. But yeah, if you, you come out 
any weekend in the kind of late fall into into winter, you're going to see fox hunters out and about. We have um, not just the Piedmont foxhounds. We've got the Blue Ridge hunt, the Orange County hunt, um, the Loudon hunt. There's a few, you know, a number of different fox hunts that are very, very active in the area. Um, and it's a huge part of the culture here. Um, earlier yeah. I mentioned the Alfred Hitchcock movie Marnie, which is yeah. filmed here. Um, a big part of that movie revolves around fox hunting. So. It's um, why don't we just take a little wander just yeah, so everyone sure. sees town is just do you want to come for a wandering and we even bring the puppy along <laughs> she's she's getting a little tired but she's been a, a real trooper but uh it's very very kind of Travis just to take time out to, so everyone feel free to share these videos because it's good for them sorry noisy truck but they are both promoting and preserving heritage in the region and it's well so Travis and I were having a good conversation earlier because you're really in the greater sphere of, you know, mass of D.C., mm -hmm. which isn't just D.C., really. It's three <laughs> three places, Maryland, Virginia. But uh, so they want to hit that fine line of keeping these places manageable in size, but not stunting growth. Right. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're, we're not anti growth. We we're for advocating for smart growth. You know, part of the reason why people love this area, why we're so connected to the landscape is the remarkable you know natural resources the remarkable historic resources um we don't want that to be lost and so yeah. you know we're not saying no development we're not saying no progress we're saying you know think about what would be lost if we don't plan carefully yeah and so my role in all this is as director of education is i go into schools free of charge um talked about four or five thousand students every single year um, sometimes we're actually able to get them out onto these historic sites basically trying to train that next generation of preservationists you know get people to think about why this area is so special why it's so beautiful um, and you know it's an incredible job I love it I love oh, it. as you can tell I love talking well, it about is. this no, but it's wonderful it's, it's, um, and now you told uh, you told two other very interesting things just coming back to segregation mm -hmm. so forth mm -hmm. that integrated juries are born out of a, a legal case here yes um, yeah this is one of the more unusual local history stories uh, in the early 1930s there's this horrific murder that occurs in Middleburg um, a wealthy heiress and her housekeeper are brutally murdered suspicion immediately falls on her uh, former chauffeur who's an african-american man um, after a year-long manhunt he's apprehended and when he goes to trial the NAACP is leading his legal defense, and the director of Howard University's law school is actually the head of his defense team. And they're trying this very novel approach that an African-American man cannot get a fair jury trial in the South as long as there are segregated juries, which sounds like common sense, but you know, in the 1930s, <laughs> it really does. Um, this was very controversial. Um, the incredible, incredible legal case. Um, he does end up being found guilty of the murder, but the jury will not sentence him to death, which in 1932 was kind of seen by the Howard University law team, by the NAACP, as a win. A win of sorts. Yeah, a absolutely. win. And one of the more interesting parts of this trial is that one of the clerks working on this trial is a young Thurgood Marshall. It's a future Supreme yeah. Court justice. So, uh, really, And was he considered a liberal justice? F fairly fairly okay yeah, yeah it is a name um, i know but it's yeah. right um but this domino kind of falls and it leads to the integration of juries throughout the south because there's this fear that you know these cases will be thrown out um if the supreme court decides that this is an unconstitutional practice so um really because of the right to a fair trial yeah. right yeah right um so it's it's a great story there's a fantastic book about it it's the murder trial of william crawford um, really, if you're interested in legal history or um, you know African American history, it's an incredible story. Bring me over to the uh, Methodist Church over here. Yeah. Beautiful and a big Episcopal, of course, presence out there here. And there was not the Catholic Church until the right until demand. Yeah, until the Kennedys is <laughs> pretty interesting. We should probably go as far as the Red Fox. Sure, the yeah. most historic building in town. Absolutely. But. Uh, lovely area yeah as and you can see the road is still very busy um this mm -hmm. was originally a native american uh trail leading from the potomac river to the blue ridge mountains um, it's adopted by the colonists in the 18th century by the 19th century it's become a turnpike road so a toll road 
um, the Ashby. Yeah, so if you're Americans, you probably know this, but it's, <laughs> I was really asking Travis because I'd heard the term turnpike before, but I see it written around here. So they were all toll roads. They were all privately run. Well, I guess it makes loads of sense, but I just didn't use the term that that much. And then you, you gave us another heavy stat, but Virginia is allowed back into the Union in 1870. Yeah, after the American Civil War. Yep. And then the the voting African American population was, or this was a li little later? In, in, in 1867, the first election that African Americans are able to vote mm -hmm. in Virginia. Um, here in Loudoun County, there are about 1,200 African American men who are voting. Of course, women did not have the right yet. Yeah. Uh, by 1902, in the new Jim Crow Constitution, that number drops to 14. So that's uh, that, so. and Travis did unpack that for us. It's, I think it'd almost be worth a talk unto itself. But you know, pretty fascinating bits of history as well. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. as long as we're on the topic of African American history, you'll notice um, some beautiful stone buildings like the Oyster Bar across the street here. Mm -hmm. um, those were all constructed by a firm, uh, William Hall and Sons, who was a local African-American builder. Um, his ancestors had been enslaved in the area. And in the early 1900s, he starts a building firm that is one of the most successful construction firms in Northern Virginia. He's uh, built, you know, the building was a bank. It's now the Oyster Bar, um, the post office in Upperville, a number of other buildings here in town, the old, um, pharmacy that's just down the block he also did some historic restoration work at mount vernon so you know in all this hardship i mean we're talking about the heart of the jim crow era we have this incredibly successful businessman who was able to make a name for himself not just here in middleburg but throughout the region um, really cool story just quality of work and yes yeah yeah, yeah. fasting um, so we have a white truck in the way unfortunately yeah. but this is Kind of the most famous building in town, you'd say? Yeah, it's yeah. A, a much older stone building, and that is the Red Fox Inn. Yeah. Um, there was an inn there at some point in the 18th century. The oldest part of the existing building probably dates to the, the late eight, uh, 18th century, uh, right around the time that Middleburg was officially incorporated, um, and then it was added on to in the early 19th century. It's still an operating inn and mm -hmm. restaurant. Very, very nice place to have a meal. In fact, we're having a meal there tonight, I understand. Yeah, well, thank <laughs> you guys. I have to recommend that everyone comes and stays with them, with Rick and Karen. <laughs> I had my own house. It is so beautiful. And that's the other interesting thing. The stone walls when we're driving around. Yes. So that was clearing land for farming. Yeah, as, yeah. as these, the land is cleared, you're, you're turning up a lot of stone. Um, a lot of that is also due to the availability of labor. Um, you know, you have a large enslaved population, so they're able to build these stone walls. Um, and then after emancipation, you have generations of stonemasons who learn their trade working on walls and other buildings around the area, so, including, yeah. you know, the halls kind of come out of that tradition. So uh, and we saw one really neat building around back where you had a stone base, a wood back, but that real kind of 19th century, 18th century wood, and then a more modern front on it. And yeah. I guess that's just it's the evolution just, of architecture. Here. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Constantly yeah. adding on to the historic structures. But, that's, uh, just, yeah. that's just fantastic. Do you want to, and you've lived here now oh, since... you've turned it on me. I have. No, 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 no. you got to be... <laughs> we moved out here in 76. 70, oh, wow. okay, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a, it's a neat time. Sorry, it's just another noisy truck going by. <laughs> but uh, but I know, I realize this was up very last minute, everyone. You're very welcome to share this. Spread the word. Travis, I cannot thank you enough. Oh, Literally God. taking time out of his day to share well things. Uh, my, my pleasure. All I ask is that you guys check out the Virginia Piedmont Heritage Area, piedmontheritage.org. Um, we love this area. We love the history. We love sharing it. That's why why we do what we do. Oh, you did a wonderful so. job. Oh, this is so fast. <laughs> this is so please share this on your own um, on your own Facebook pages, and uh, and just put a link to piedmontheritage.org. Yep. Dot org. That would be. Thanks, everyone. So yeah, thank listen, you. peace and love. And you know, I just. I've had an interesting week because I was in D.C. for a conference, but I went to the African American Museum on Sunday, and then we come and have these conversations with people I think we're, I share a lot of a value system with. It's heavy history. Like, it is heavy, powerful history, and we were tied right into the Caribbean, so you'll join me as long as I can get reception when I'm in Cuba next month, and I'll give you some tours there. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Travis. Much appreciated.